Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Fantasy Bros Football Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Harris. With me is Mike Tagliere. Find us on Twitter at Dan Harris80 and at Mike Tagliere NFL. Tags, how you doing? You ready for Wild Card Weekend? I am so ready. I, I, I love this time of year, though, because you're not rooting for your fantasy teams anymore. You're kind of just being a football fan. And yeah. that's what it's really about. Now, honestly, we're going we're about to get into some DFS stuff, so that's going to have some rooting interest. But I I don't I play I definitely do play DFS on the and this is probably the, the one I'm going to play most because I don't like smaller slates. Yeah. I, I typically suck with showdown type stuff, but this one having six games in the slate it feels kind of I don't want to say normal, but there's plenty of options for you. Uh, but it, it's 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 nice, dude. I, I I love this. I was able to take a I took a two mile walk before our show and that's something i just haven't been able to do in a long time yeah it is weird now with this ending like i, I was uh i take a family walk now with the dog and everything yeah. like that and we all go out and it's very bizarre but i agree last weekend was sort of the first time in a while to just watch football right without mm-hmm. sort of having the analyst hat at and that's great and i'm really excited for this week and of course super wild card weekend technically but we are going to talk some dfs today and to break down we've got a great guest it's Derek Cardi from Roto Grinders you know him he does the blitz blitz projection system you can find him on Twitter at Derek Cardi Derek thanks for popping on yeah absolutely thanks for having me on yeah this is uh this is pretty exciting I'm excited to hear about the six game slate it's going to be a great weekend of games uh so again we've got six of them so we're going to be breaking down the same breakdown that we usually use for this show we start with the favorite pricier cash game play at each position we'll discuss a couple of cash game value plays at each position we'll do one gpp gamble at each position quick discussion of a defense and then the stack of the week and the lock of the week but before we get into it let me talk quickly about the daily juice podcast 15 minutes every single morning when you wake up talks about the best sports gambling plays of the day hosted by matt peralt from betting pros Longtime radio host from Vegas. He hosts a radio show now that you can listen to on Sirius XM Radio. He touches on everything. The NFL, of course, but, you know, college basketball. He's got the bowl games, of course, that he's been doing. Everything, though. Golf when it's played. Boxing, MMA, all the good stuff. Anywhere you listen to podcasts or on bettingpros.com slash Daily Juice. Again, that is the Daily Juice podcast. All right. Let's do the favorite pricier cash game play of the weekend and let's start with you Derek at running back go ahead kick us off who do you got yeah so I'm not sure if I'm actually going to be spending up at running back I think it's pretty clearly Henry or Kamara if you are if I'm doing it it's probably Kamara you know you save 700 it's really not a great spot for Henry you know this isn't a spot like he's been in the past few weeks where you know the Titans have have a 32 team total and they're a 10 point favorite and the game script's going to be great and you know everything else like he's facing the Baltimore Ravens they're an underdog you know the team total's a lot lower 9200 for Derrick Henry in that situation just seems like a lot to me even Kamara 8500 on DraftKings with Michael Thomas back like the target share is going to come down presumably he's going to play Latavius Murray's going to be back so it's going to be back to you know a timeshare on the ground um, I think if you're splitting it up, you know, you're playing the, the three-game slate and the three-game slate on Saturday and Sunday, like, you can probably play Kamara on the Sunday or whichever day he's on, but the full six-gamer, I don't know if I'm going to be spending up at running back. Yeah, that's always the million-dollar question, right? We talk about who would be your favorite price your cash game play of the weekend, and a lot of times the answer is, well, I'm not playing a price here running back on the weekend but if I were it would be him tags what do you think Derek Henry 9200 Kamara uh, 8500 are you playing either one of these guys this weekend in cash I'm probably gonna go with Henry uh I don't I'm kind of with Derek on this one a little bit because I think that you know I mean it's not a value play but Jonathan Taylor it feels like a discounted Derek Henry right now at 7900 he played a um uh, 82% of snaps in week 17. That was a must win game for the Colts. And that was the season high. He had not been over 70% before that game. So Jonathan Taylor is someone that they've, they've obviously grown into a role. Buffalo, if, if there's a strength of that team, it's the secondary uh, where they should slow down those wide receivers. So Taylor feels like a discounted version of Derrick Henry, but the problem is Naheem Hines is still involved in some capacity and there's always that possibility that Frank Reich just changes everything and Naheem Hines gets goal line carries and throws everything off uh, and I think that's why I might pay for Derrick Henry because he's the type of guy that we've talked about it you know you get to this point and you get on a smaller slate and if Derrick Henry rushes for 150 yards and a touchdown or even two touchdowns you're you're out of the cash and you're not going to cash in the lineup because there's no other there's just no 
obvious options when you when you work down through the slate because even the guys that are getting touches like Alvin Kamara tough matchup against the Bears they've been really good through the air against running backs they're actually one of I think two teams in the NFL that did not allow a receiving touchdown to running backs all season long uh, they just played Alvin Kamara's doppelganger last week and Aaron Jones slowed him down quite a bit the Bears defense is not or the, the run defense is not really their problem uh, so if I'm going to pay up it's probably Derrick Henry who uh, he did rush for 133 yards and a touchdown against the Ravens back in week 11 I think it was and then if you go back to last year in the playoffs when everyone knew what was coming the Ravens did allow him to rush for 195 yards on 30 carries so at the running back position you're paying for touches and if there's anyone on the slate that you can legitimately guarantee 20 touches it's Derrick Henry because they're gonna they're gonna live or die by him and it doesn't even matter if, if they're down 14 points they're still gonna run the ball with Derrick Henry so um I, I do like Henry if you're paying up. So, Derek, I, I don't know if you mentioned this, so sorry if I missed it. So, obviously, the two priciest running backs on the slate are Henry at 9,200 on DraftKings and Kamara at 8,500. Are you, do you think, going to pay up to basically the only other really guy who's over 7K on DraftKings, Jonathan Taylor at 7,900, or is that too rich for your blood as well? I think that's still a little... A little tough to get to like I think he's fine like I think all three of these guys you know in terms of their salaries are pretty similar so if you just want to save a little bit and you have that money like Taylor's fine but but like you said like Naheem Hines is still there Naheem Hines is still getting more of the pass game work and like I get that people like want to love Jonathan Taylor and like he's good and like you know he was this guy who was super hyped coming into the year and then you know, the last few weeks, he's like finally made good on, on that potential and everything. And like, it's a great story. And I get all that. But at the same time, like, I'm not a person who really puts a whole lot of stock in, you know, quote unquote, running back talent. Um, you know, it's just not something that tends to matter as much as it does at other positions. And so I like Taylor. I think he's fine here. Um, but he's not super involved in the pass game. And, you know, they're, they're going to be a, a pretty solid underdog here. Um, so, so how much groundwork is he necessarily going to get? Like, he's fine. He's fine. But for me, I, I'm prioritizing other positions and probably just going cheaper at running back because I think there is a good amount of value here. Yeah, I think that's the play, too. You know, on FanDuel, Henry is 10200 I'm just probably not going to want to pay up for that. Kamara is 9000 Taylor, I want to like this weekend because I think that the Colts probably are going to try to attack the Bills as much as they can on the ground and keep Josh Allen off the field if they can. But again, they're six and a half point underdogs. And you can see a scenario where they fall behind, you know, early, but significantly. And Hines just gets in there and gets more work. Now, Taylor has been running a lot more routes over the last few games. But again, it's just too risky for me to want to do that on Fandle, even at 8,800. You can do it. It's a lot easier to fit in the high price guys there. But yeah, none of them is particularly enticing for cash game plays on the slate just given the price but let's go to wide receiver here let's talk about your favorite again stick with the pricier cash game options here let's start there at wide receiver who do you like here Derek? uh i mean honestly it's not like we have anyone who's like super expensive here but i think stefan diggs is pretty clearly the cream of the crop he, he's he's the most expensive at 7.7k so he's cheaper than all three of those high-end running backs and he projects straight up higher than Kamara, higher than jonathan taylor and so for me, Stefan Diggs is uh, is the guy that I'll be I'll be spending up on. Like I think he is obviously extremely good. Buffalo is the most pass heavy team on the slate. His target share is massive, over thirty percent, one of the highest of any wide receiver in football. His efficiency is great. This indie defense, I know at times this year people have been like, oh, I don't want to attack the, the indie defense. Like it's it's really nothing special, especially against wide receivers. Uh, Diggs, Diggs is underpriced at 7.7K, and I don't think that's necessarily true of any of those running backs. So for me, Diggs is a guy that I'll be almost certainly spending up on. Yeah, tags Diggs, the most expensive receiver on the slate at 7,700. Next up is A.J. Brown at 7,100, but still, I agree with Derek. 7,700 seems like a value to me still. He's definitely the expensive play here. Uh, he's caught at least six passes in 15 of 16 games this year, which is, in a PPR format, that's just stupid. Uh, you just don't see wide receivers do that very often, especially ones that are priced at 7,700. Usually, that's this is like Devontae Adams-type territory, where you're going to get over 9K for a wide receiver. Uh, and then, as Derek mentioned, the Colts defense, a lot of people have this view in their mind that the Colts are a, a really good defense, but that really hasn't been the case. Uh, if you look at their last uh, seven games, they've allowed 10 different wide receivers to score 15 or more PPR points against them. 
them, including seven wide receivers who hit uh, 20 PPR points. So uh, the 8.81 yards per target they've allowed to wide receivers was the 10th most in the season. So as long as volume is there, you're really not worried about it. And again, you're going back to the idea that this Buffalo team, the running backs just don't score any points. And yep. Indianapolis does not allow production on the ground. So it's all going to come through Josh Allen. If Josh Allen has a good game, that the Bills are winning this game. Obviously, they're projected to win by six and a half points. Uh, and it's that it's going to go through the air. With Cole Beasley a little bit dinged up, obviously that's something that can limit his production. Stephon Diggs has been the he's been rising as the year has gone on. He just becomes more and more comfortable with Josh Allen. So there is absolutely zero reason that you should not play Stephon Diggs. Yep. I'm in complete agreement on Fandle. He's the priciest as well at 8,700. That's just not enough. That's not enough in any way, shape or form to keep me off him at all. He's absolutely, he, he's safe. And you mentioned it tags. I mean, you know, the bills are going to win this game. Josh Allen is going to have a good game. He's playing as well as you could possibly play, regardless of if Beasley comes back, Brown is back. It's going to be a big game for them. And as you mentioned, if there's production, it's just not going to be on the ground. Like it's not, I mean, it might be on the ground, but it's going to be through Allen. It's not going to be on the running back. So yeah, I agree with you guys. We're all in on Diggs. And again, on both sides, I think he's underpriced. Let's get to quarterback here. Who's your favorite price here cash game play of the weekend, Derek? So, I mean, it's clearly Allen and, and Lamar Jackson. Like they are both the highest raw point projections by a lot and also the highest point per dollar guys. Like, they both project for over 25 points, and there's not another quarterback on the slate that projects for over 20. So in cash games, like, you're not considering anybody else. It's literally one of these two guys, and it's just, I feel like, terrible to play anyone else. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's splitting hairs a little bit between them. I probably lean with Allen if for no other reason than because he's a little bit cheaper. Yep. But you really can play either one, I think. Yeah, Jackson 7,800, Allen 7,500 on DraftKings on uh, a similar price difference between them on FanDuel, 9,300 for Lamar Jackson, 9,000 for Josh Allen. So tags, I, I agree. It, it's one of those two for me. Is it one of those two for you? And if it is, do you have a, a strong preference between them? Yeah, it's absolutely one of those two. And I, I, I'm i writing an, a DFS article that's going to come up later today uh, for the site. And I, I was going back and forth because I wrote both of these guys up. And I was like, I, I was torn while writing it, which one I was going to recommend more. And ultimately, I think I wound up with Allen just because of the fact that, you know, just what we mentioned about Stephon Diggs. There is no run game for the Bills. There, There's none. You don't have to worry about, oh, does Josh Allen lose touchdowns to Devin Singletary and Zach Moss? You don't have to worry about that, uh, especially against Indianapolis that has a, a stout run defense, one of the better ones in the NFL. Whereas Lamar Jackson, he's a guy that if you look at his two games against Mike Vrabel's defense that he's played, um, and again, both of those games have come in the last you know 13 months. So he's thrown for 541 yards, two touchdowns, three interceptions, not great. Uh, but he did rush for 194 yards. That's, that amounts to 46 fantasy points, so it's still not bad. But again, Lamar Jackson, there's a chance that his running backs, you know, someone like J.K. Dobbins, who's been playing extremely well lately, can run all over that Tennessee Titan second uh, defense because they're struggling to generate pressure. I'm really wondering what they're going to do. And if they bring a blitz, if he gets through that first line of defense, he's gone. You right. know, he's he's taking off. So there's a chance that Lamar Jackson loses some of that production, whereas Josh Allen doesn't. And then you add in the fact that Josh Allen's $300 cheaper, and I'm kind of like, all right, I'm going to lean towards Allen. Yeah. No, I, I, Allen is my guy as well. And it's as much about the few hundred dollars that you can save as it is, is I, you know, I, I haven't gone crazy with the projections for, for this weekend. Obviously tags, we do it, you know, during in season and stuff like that. I haven't gone crazy, but Allen did come out as my highest projected quarterback, generally speaking on the system in FanDuel anyway. So I would go with Allen, even if they were priced identically. I, I just think at, at this point, you're. I mean, Indy, we saw, you know, Mike Lennon, you know, I know it was in comeback mode, but he passed all over them. They're, they allow passing yards of late, and Allen is just too locked in at the moment in that Bills offense. And, you know, I don't worry about it with Lamar Jackson. You mentioned the rushing yards that he's had against Tennessee lately, but I do think that you're right, Tags, and that you could see. I like Dobbins. We'll talk about him uh, in a little bit. I like Dobbins on the slate, and they don't get any pressure, really, the, mm -hmm. the Titans, and I think that that, you know, might be worse, you know, for, for Jackson to, to really have the big rushing game, even though, you know, I know he's he's got the high floor at this point, but I think maybe that the ceiling a little bit lower, but regardless, you are splitting hairs. We're all in agreement. It's one of those two. I do slightly prefer Allen, but I would, I'll say that I would probably even go with Allen, even if they were priced identically. Let's go to tight end here. I mean, tight end is a wasteland on a good day. Uh, when Travis Kelsey isn't on the slate, it's you know, certainly not great here. So Derek, price here, cash game play. Who do you like? 
I mean, I feel like there's really only like one pricey tight end. I mean, I guess there's, I guess there's maybe two or three, but but it's Mark Andrews pretty clearly. Like he's far and away the best raw tight end on this slate, and I think he might even be the best value on this slate. Like he's obviously really good. Um, Baltimore is a team that's going to run a lot, sure, but his target share, especially since Nick Boyle went out, like he's basically working as like the only tight end that is catching passes for them right now. His target share has just gone through the roof since then. And this is a pretty good matchup against a Tennessee team that, you know, does give up some points to tight ends. Um, and like you said, it, it's a wasteland. So Andrews is clearly the spend up. Tags, you know, I, I try to talk about Logan Thomas anytime I can. But even I can't justify uh, on either site paying for him over Mark Andrews. What do you think? Yeah, I think Andrews is the obvious play if you have the funds available to you. It's really difficult in a slate, though, really. I mean, because usually we could find a running back that's there's an injury on the slate. There's someone with COVID that was ruled out, and you could find like a value running back play. There's just not those 4K guys in this, in this one, so it's going to be difficult to pay up for someone like Mark Andrews, uh, especially if you're going to look to pay up at running back or wide receiver. Uh, but Andrews is definitely a good play. The Titans have allowed the 13th most fantasy points to tight ends. That's despite seeing the sixth fewest targets to them. So, um you know, they allow 75% completion rate to them, which is the highest mark in the NFL. The 2.06 PPR points per target ranked as the third highest mark. Andrews in week 11 against this team totaled five catches for 96 yards and a touchdown. And that's before Lamar Jackson was playing particularly well. So, um, yeah, I mark if you're paying up, it's Mark Andrews for sure. But it sounds like you're not paying up, right, Tex? I don't know if I can fit him. Like, I'm still working my way through this slate and trying yep. to figure out the line of construction, what I want to do. But if I were to pay up, it would definitely be for Andrews. Yep. All right. We're all in agreement there. Again, he's 7K on Fandle. Again, fitting anybody in on Fandle is just a lot easier than it is on DraftKings. So you can probably build a lineup around it. I have just to mess around with it. And it does work out for me. But yeah, I agree. If you are going that route, it would be Mark Andrews. Let's go to value plays here, guys. And let's stick with cash games. Let's start again with running back. I'll start with you again, Derek. Let's talk about a value game play at the running back position for cash games. Cam Akers is the guy that that sticks out as as severely underpriced on this slate at 5,100. You know, he came back last week. You know, we thought early in the week he wasn't going to play and everyone was on Malcolm Brown. And then we got off Brown when, you know, they said Akers was going to play. We didn't know if he was going to be limited at all. He wasn't. He went out there. He basically got his full complement of snaps. Um, Daryl Henderson is out now, so it is basically just him and Brown. And he is going to be, presumably, clearly the lead guy here. He's going to catch, you know, a decent amount of passes. He's going to get 80% of the carries, probably. Um, 5,100 for Akers is just, is just too cheap. Does it matter for you? I mean, I, I, it sounds like it doesn't, but does it matter for you who starts at quarterback? Are we assuming that Goff sits in this game? It really doesn't matter for me. I'm assuming at this point that Goff is going to play, but even, in, I mean, regardless, you know, if Goff sits, then then they're going to probably run it more with Akers. Right. If Goff plays, then, you know, Akers is going to have higher touchdown equity because they're going to, you know, move the ball a little bit better. So, like... I think regardless, at his workload in this price, you play him whoever the quarterback is. Yeah, I agree. He was on my list for sure. What is he, 5,100 on mm -hmm. DraftKings? He's 6,100 still a value on Fandle. I just think, you know, he didn't, you know, have a good line last week, but he got so much work, and I think you can probably assume that he was still working his way back from the ankle injury. So the fact that they gave him that much work is something that I think bodes well for him this week. Tags, what do you think about Akers? That's my worry is like usually on a cash game slate, I would stay away from someone like Cam Akers who that high ankle sprain, you know, we watched Alvin Kamara last year. People talked about, oh, is he not that good anymore? And it was just like the guy came back too early from a high ankle sprain. He was never the same for the remainder of the year. So I don't think it's a coincidence that we saw Cam Akers be the most inefficient version of himself in week 17 against the Arizona Cardinals in a must win game. Uh, 21 carries 34 yards against Arizona. That's not great. I mean, Arizona had been struggling a little bit, uh, stopping running backs on the ground. The good news is that Akers did see four targets with Goff out last week. And that was the highest that he's seen all season. Uh, so Akers is someone that I, I, I want to like, and I really do want to like in cash, but I think it, it almost feels like it could be a trap. I think this game is going to be one of the lower scoring ones on the slate. Um, and that's obviously never a good thing, but is Daryl Henderson going to be back? And if he is back, you know, does Cam Akers lose some of those touches? Do they do they get to run the ball as much? Because Russell Wilson and the, the Seahawks offense, do they go back to their old ways, run the ball quite a bit, just steal up all the clock? 
there's a lot, there's just so many damn question marks around acres, but on a small slate like this, I don't know if I can pass up $5,100 as a value. Yeah, that's the thing. The price sort of makes it, I, I think we all kind of agree. I don't think anybody's going into this being like Cam Akers. This is a, a giant spot for Cam Akers to just have a monstrous game. It's just much right. more about the price and where it is. And essentially, again, we have six games, okay? Not everything is going to be the prettiest thing right. that we could possibly do. All right, Tag. So if it's not Cam Akers, then who is the guy that you're looking at as a value in cash games? I really like J.D. McKissick on DraftKings, and I know that it's it's a scary play to many people because, you know, he's been up and down in his production, but I think it really comes down to the game script and what we're projecting, right? Because uh, they're eight-point favorites. It was eight and a half. It went to eight. Yeah. Uh, but I think many people, I would say probably 85% of people are going to project uh, the Bucks to win this game, and if that's the case, then McKissick's probably going to be the more valuable running back. Uh, if you look at the game sl splits between Antonio Gibson and J.D. McKissick, they are flip-flopped, okay? When Antonio Gibson, in games that Washington wins, that dude crushes. He's on the field a little bit more, but he absolutely crushes because he gets most of the work and he gets all that goal line work, whereas McKissick, when the team falls behind, that game script flips. You don't even need more production on the ground. In losses, he averages just .4 more rushing yards but it's all about the targets he averages 3.3 more targets per game uh three receptions per game 20 more receiving yards per game and obviously he has more touchdown upside through the air uh, he averages in all in all he averages six and a half more ppr points per game in losses than he does in wins so this comes down to the the bucks what projecting game script which is something we actually have to do uh when you're talking about these plays and on top of that the bucks allowed the fewest fantasy points on the ground to running backs this year like legit like it was uh 20 fewer fantasy points than any other team in the league so they're they're not a team you're going to run the ball against they i think they allowed sub three yards per carry through the air they allowed the fifth most fantasy points to running backs so again i understand that this comes with a little bit of game script risk but I think McKissick looks like a tremendous value at 4,900. Derek, what do you think about McKissick? I mean, McKissick was going to be the guy I was going to use when we talk about GPP players because I didn't think anyone was going to be on McKissick. I, I love him. Like, I, I have him as a cash play, too. I just think he's going to be one that's low-owned but but certainly worth having. Like, I, for all the reasons you just said, I love McKissick. And I don't even worry about the game script because he's not a guy who's going to get a lot of work on the ground anyway. He's going to get 15% of the carries. So, like... Yep. You, you want them to be down and throwing the ball because, you know, with Alex Smith throwing the ball this year, he's gotten like 21% of the targets. That's like wide receiver one volume for, mm -hmm. you know, for this running back. And uh, it's going to be the fastest pace game on the slate by a lot. So there's going to be a lot of raw plays run here. So McKissick just seems like a great play to me. Yeah, I mean, the target volume is just always there. It really doesn't even matter, you know, really. who's the, I mean, He's got 28 targets over the last three games. So, yeah, I, I like it, Tags. I mean, he's going to have the floor, and you're right. They're not going to be able to run the ball at all. Um, no team is, really, against the Bucks. So they're probably going to have to go to him. And, again, with McLaurin kind of limited as well, right, with, with his injuries and stuff like that, and maybe not at 100%. They, you know, what Cam Sims, whatever you want to talk about, you know, they need somebody else to be catching the ball. And McKissick has been that guy pretty much all year. And I think he's going to continue to be that guy. So I do like him as a cash game play. And look, you blew Derek's mind. Derek was thinking only about him in GPPs. Now he knows he's got to think about him more uh, that people are going to be on him. So uh, be aware of that. Let's go to wide receivers here. Cash game value play. Start us off, Derek. It's Michael Thomas for sure. Like I think Michael Thomas is the best raw wide receiver on this slate. I would be 0% surprised if Thomas finishes ahead of Diggs and he's 1,300 less. He's 6,400. Like, assuming he's back. But it does sound like he's going to be back. It does sound like he's going to be healthy. And, you know, with Drew, Drew Brees at quarterback, he's going to be throwing the ball. This is the only game in a dome on this slate. Every other game is like 30 or 40 degrees they're going to be playing in 72 degrees in the dome, no wind. Um, and Michael Thomas is Michael Thomas. Like if he's back to himself and healthy, you know, he's just, he's a smash at 6,400. Tags, what do you think? Yeah, this is one where I was like going through and I was writing that cash game article and I almost put Thomas in there because like I love the play and I actually think the Bears secondary uh, has been struggling a bit as of late. Thomas plays majority of his snaps on the at the at on the left side of the formation, which means he's going to see um, a backup cornerback because Jalen Johnson, their rookie, has been out for multiple weeks. Uh, Thomas also moves into the slot. Buster Screen's been out. Buster Screen sucks anyways. Let's be honest about it. Uh, he's not very good. So Michael Thomas, I do like. Now, I, I tend to have, try to avoid risk when it comes to cash games and like a player coming off a multi-week injury. 
but this does feel a little bit different. I, I, I really do agree with Derek on this one because it feels different because they, they shut him down for this purpose. They knew they were making it to the playoffs. They knew it was very unlikely that they would get the number one overall seed. Let's just rest him, get him right for the playoffs. He's back on the field. The Bears, again, they have struggled down the stretch against some wide receivers. I don't think this is a bad play at all, and his price, 6400 uh, it's really tough for me to pass on him. Um, I, I think that I do have a player I like more uh, as, as a value just because I feel – I just feel like he's a guarantee, whereas Michael Thomas feels close, but there are still some question marks coming off that injury and whether or not he is that same player. All right, so who is your guy then, Tex? Deontay Johnson. Uh, you know, if if you read the primer throughout the year, you guys know that I, I talked about the reason that the Steelers were never going to bench Deontay Johnson more than, you know, a couple series. They can't do it. There's no one, there's nobody else in that team that plays the role that he does in that offense. There's no one else that gains the separation he does. Uh, he plays a very specific role, and Ben Roethlisberger trusts him extreme, like a lot. Uh, when you look at the 12 full games that Johnson has played with Roethlisberger, where he didn't leave extremely early without injury, he's seen at least 10 targets in 10 of 12 games. That is volume you do not find at a wide receiver that's priced at 6,200. And then you add in the fact that Deontay Johnson is seemingly over his drop issues. He's, he's actually made some very spectacular catches over the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, this Brown secondary, that's where you attack them. They're, they're not generating a whole lot of pass rush. Miles Garrett is their pass rush, basically. And if he doesn't get there, then they have problems. The Steelers are one of the best uh, – in the league when it comes to their offensive line protecting Roethlisberger. They're a great pass blocking unit. They're terrible at run uh, run blocking. So I think Roethlisberger, I mean, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but I think Roethlisberger is a fantastic play. I think you could play his wide receivers, and Deontay Johnson is the stable one. And on top of that, the, the Browns will be without one of their starting cornerbacks for this game, Kevin Johnson. Um, he – he was out earlier in the year for weeks, I think one, two, and four, and they really, really struggled with wide receivers. So uh, Deontay Johnson, it just feels like it's 6,200. For a guy getting the targets he does, I feel like he should be around 7,500. Yep. He was uh, on my list as well, especially for Fandle where he's 7,000. Frankly, I think you can play all three Steelers wide receivers this yeah, week, and they're, they're all going to be solid. I think this is going to be just a kind of a, a beat down a little bit here, especially with all the issues that the Browns are dealing with. So let's talk about Deontay Johnson, you know, first. Derek, what do you think about Deontay Johnson at his price on DraftKings? I mean, I think he's fine. For me, I'm not considering him because Thomas is, you know, 200 more and I have not projected for like eight points more. Um, but I've always just been a huge Michael Thomas guy. Like mm -hmm. when Michael Thomas is healthy and getting his normal volume, you know, he's worth nine or 10K in this spot. And I don't see any scenario where Deontay is ever worth nine or 10 K, but I mean, I like him, you know, he's, he's clearly the lead guy there. Like you said, he gets a separation, he gets the targets, not a great game script for that. Um, you know, and, and I'm not convinced he's over his drop issues. Like I still think we have to expect that he is one of the most inefficient wide receivers per target in football at this point, but I think he's fine. You know, I think he's fine. So briefly, let me follow up on Thomas, just because Tags did mention it. This is his going to be his first game back, obviously off IR. And he came back and he, you know, wasn't 100% healthy, although he had a couple of decent games. Do you worry at all, especially given that, you know, that what what we're looking at and one, one kind of bad play in cash could kind of doom you? Do you worry at all, Derek, about the fact that, like, we, I mean, we're probably not going to know 100% that he's 100% healthy, right, coming in. I mean, he returned to practice but are you just saying look if he's back here i'm just taking it for granted that he's going to be at 100 percent. i don't need to see any like specific like full go no worries whatsoever it's his first game back no worries whatsoever there about limitations given the high the, given the high ankle sprain that's bothering him all year so if if we hear that there's a limitation then that will change things for me if we don't hear anything then then i'm just gonna i'm just gonna risk it yep. you know yep. there, there's been enough reports that say he should be healthy you know uh uh, what's his name? David Chow, pro football doc. He put out a thing, I think a couple days ago, basically saying that he expects Thomas to be close to hundred percent. And honestly, he doesn't have to be anywhere near hundred percent here to be worth this. Like if it was like a close call for me where it's, you know, like Thomas is, you know, more expensive or he's projecting worse or whatever. And it's like kind of a coin flip then. Yeah. Th then I'll lean towards the safer play, but he literally projects as the top wide receiver on the slate and, and he's 6,400. Like he is legit, probably $2,000 underpriced if he's even 80%. Yeah. 
Yep. And so for me, that's just I, I'm just risking it. Like I, I just don't care. Yeah. So we that... talked about oh, we, real quick. We talked about the game script. You were saying about the game script concern with Deontay Johnson. Do we have that same concern with Thomas? I mean, they're ten point favorites uh, in this game, and this is a team that obviously. So the Steelers can't run the ball. That that's legitimately been a problem the entire second half of the year. Whereas the Saints, I mean, is it is it not a possibility that they run the ball? You know, and score four rushing touchdowns because Kamara and Latavius Murray are actually really damn good <laughs> yeah no that, that's certainly a concern like this is not a good game script for Thomas yeah. but Thomas also gets a higher share of the passing than Deontay just does you know Deontay is going to be you know 24 25 percent Thomas assuming he's you know close to healthy is going to be 30 or 35 percent like that that's a big difference and they're in the dome so it's better conditions for passing in the cold teams tend to run more and and so Pittsburgh is outside in what like 31 degree weather this week it looks like so you know that that all kind of factors in for me as well yeah yep. all right so again just to two things very quickly to follow up on number one dr child is a, a weekly guest on our podcast on fridays and when his injury insight is generally speaking right on the money so i trust what he says so that's good to know that he has put that out there second wanted to make it clear wasn't in any way criticizing the call of michael thomas as the cash game play but i do think that people who are setting their dfs lineups do want to know be like okay well what if you know yeah i don't hear about any limitations but i'm a little worried about it because it's his first game back how do you feel about it, it sounds like you are good with it again you mentioned it even if he's at 80 percent, you still think his price point would be too low so that is very good for people who are setting dfs lineups for them to know let's go to quarterback here let's go to cash game value plays and stick with that and who's a quarterback for you if you're not paying up for Lamar Jackson or Josh Allen I think the only other guy I'd probably be considering is is Mitchell Trubisky um 5300 is is pretty cheap for him and like I said with uh like with Thomas like this is the only game that is actually good passing conditions every other game is outside in the cold this is a dome so so not only is the team more incentivized to pass a little bit more um, but obviously they are going to be an underdog, so they're going to be passing more because of that. And efficiency goes up um, when there's no wind in a dome. So, so 5300 for Trubisky, I like. I think he's the best, um, you know, the best cheap value quarterback. What do you think, Tags? I mean, they're ten point underdogs. They're probably going to need to throw, right? You would think so. Um, I don't. I don't mind Trubisky, uh, but I, I don't know. It, it was. It was definitely disheartening to see what happened to him last week in Week 17 uh, against the Packers team. The Packers know him pretty well, and he did play decent against the Saints in their matchup last year. It's the same defensive scheme, so I don't think Trubisky's a bad play. But if if I'm able to, I would rather get up to Roethlisberger, because again, this comes down to trying to find a guy that <clears throat> you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about much with him. I don't think you have to worry about game script with him because if they're ahead, they're still not going to run the ball because they just they can't. Then um, they're throwing the ball away at that point. Uh, and then if they fall behind in the game, which seems very unlikely, obviously Roethlisberger is going to rack up the attempts. Um, uh, it's just there. There have been just three running backs who have topped 66 yards on the ground against the Browns all year. There have been five quarterbacks who have thrown for at least 315 yards, including two who threw for 400 or more yards. A lot has changed since these teams played back in Week Six. Roethlisberger only threw the ball 22 times in that game. It was a route. It was 38 to seven. Um, again, throwing the ball 22 times is not something that's happened even close ever again this year. I think that every other game he's thrown at least 32 times. So knowing that his, you know, he has Chase Claypool like as a regular part of the offense now, Deontay Johnson is healthy. Um, Juju Smith-Schuster is healthy. This this Browns defense is just, that secondary in particular is, is there, it's ripe for the taking. And I, uh, this is this is where I'm working through because I really do like Ben and I think that like he's probably a great tournament play and you could stack him with like a couple wide receivers, but I think that he's safe in cash too if you need to save some funds because I don't know if everybody's going to have money to pay up for someone like Josh Allen. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. Roethlisberger is 6100. Uh, Derek, what do you think about him as a cash game play? I think he's fine. Um, for me, I think it's kind of an awkward price range where I don't see a lot of constructions where where I would end up there. Like you know if I'm I think the only reason I'm getting off of Allen or Jackson is if I'm trying to spend up on a running back. And if I'm trying to spend up on a running back, especially if I want Kamara or Henry, um, I'll just take the extra savings on Trubisky. I, I think Roethlisberger is better in a raw sense, but I do think those extra savings go go a long way, and I think Trubisky's a little bit better of a value because of it. All right, well, let's get to tight end here. If we're not paying up for Andrews and cash, where are you going at this position in cash games? Uh, it's Johnny Smith for me. I, I think they're really like the only two tight ends that, that I think are really any good at all this week. 
Um, Johnny's just a little underpriced at, at 3,200. You know, it's not like a great spot or anything, but you know, Tennessee is an underdog, so maybe passing a little bit more. And, and really, it's just a matter of the price being too cheap. Like he's he's cheaper than than Eric Ebron, who's going to get you know the same volume. He's cheaper than Tyler Higby. He's cheaper than Austin Hooper. He's way cheaper than Logan Thomas. He's just you know he's he's just too cheap for for his role in that offense and and who he is. Tags, thoughts on Janu at 3,200 on DraftKings? He's definitely the value play for me as well. Uh, I wrote down that basically unless you pay up for Andrews, you're not guaranteed much of anything at the tight end position. So it makes sense to look for the tight end who's got the best chance to score. Uh, the total on this Ravens-Titans game is 54.5, which is head and shoulders above any other game on the slate. And if there's one position that the Ravens do struggle with, it's tight ends more than anything. Uh, John o. Smith did score against them in their playoff matchup last year. Uh, he scored against them in Week 11 this year when he caught four passes for 20 yards. I know Week 17 was a dud for him, but he had seen 12 targets in the previous two games, so that was more in line with what we were seeing from him earlier this season. So uh, John o. Smith is is definitely, if, if you were to put the odds on the tight end that's most likely to score on this slate, outside of Mark Andrews, I think you'd have to put Johnu Smith uh, as the number one option. So it, it's 3,200. It just feels cheap enough to where you understand that even in cash games, it's going to be a little risky. But if you can't get to Andrews, everybody's going to come with some risk. That's the thing. In the tight end position this week, there is no, you know, other than Andrews, there is nobody who you, you're you going to feel absolutely great about putting into your lineup anyway. But I agree. I, I think Johnu is by far the most likely, other than Andrews, to score a touchdown this week. I I'm kind of expecting him to, to be honest, at this point. So, yeah, I agree with you guys. We're all on the same page here. Let's go to GPPs. Let's go to the running back position and start there, as we always do. Who are you looking at in GPPs, Derek? I mean, I was looking at J.D. McKissick. Not but... anymore, right? No, it's all done. <laughs> so we already talked about him. So I'll throw out James Conner, um, especially especially because we've been talking up um, – you know, Pittsburgh passing pieces to this point. Like I know, I know tags like Deontay and Ben, and if a lot of people are of that same mindset where, you know, Pittsburgh is going to throw the ball, even if, you know, it's a running game script, they're still just going to throw the ball because that's, you know, how the matchup is, or that's what Pittsburgh wants to do or whatever. Um, you know, there is always a chance, you know, there's always a probability of everything. And I think there is still a pretty decent chance that if they're up, 10 points or 14 points in the second half, they are going to run the ball a little bit more. You know, I've never been a big James Conner guy. Like, I don't think he's anything special. I don't think I've played him in DFS all year. Um, but if Pittsburgh is going to be, um, you know, fairly high owned, then Conner will get you leverage off of that. And I think he's a great value play just to begin with at 5K. So so I think Conner on this slate is is perfectly fine. I think he's even a cash option, honestly. Huh? All right. Tags, what do you think about Connor? I was actually going to bring him up too. Uh, him and Ronald Jones were the two I was going to talk about because they're the two guys that are going to kind of be overlooked because there's value guys around those guys. And then if obviously if you're going to get out of that range, you're going to go up to the more expensive options. Uh, Connor's, you know, I just, that team has struggled so much to run the ball, but it makes sense when you factor in the game script, what the Steelers used to be about, knowing it's playoff football and all that stuff. It's played in cold weather and it, you know, James Conner arguably should be relatively fresh based on, you know, the usage that he's had over the second half of the season. Uh, but yeah, no, Connor, Akers and Ronald Jones, those three in that range, those are more tournament guys to me. Akers is closest to cash just because of the touches he got last week, which does remove some of that concern. But again, that high ankle thing, he just might not be as efficient, but uh, I do like Connor. I like that tournament call. Do you have another tournament call tags that you were thinking about at running back? No, it's just it, when, when it comes to tournaments and slates like this, you just have to search for ownership is basically what you're looking for. You're looking for a guy that's guaranteed touches and that it has low ownership. And I yep. think that Connor fits that. Ronald Jones is another guy that fits it. Got it. Let's go to if Jonathan Taylor winds up. I don't know who the chalk is going to be, but like if Taylor winds up being the chalk running back because people want to save over Henry and Kamara, I think Hines is great leverage yeah. um, and will probably be very low on regardless. Yeah, that's a good call for GPPs. Let's go to wide receiver, though. Who are you looking at here in GPPs, Derek? Uh, for me, it's going to be Terry McLaurin. The The injury is obviously, you know, a little bit worrisome. Um, obviously, Alex Smith hasn't targeted him nearly as much as the other quarterbacks for Washington has this year. The matchup's not anything, you know, not anything great against Tampa Bay. But Terry McLaurin is just good. Like, Terry McLaurin is a top five wide receiver in football. Like, he, he just is, and people don't talk about him that way because he plays with bad quarterbacks. But he's 6,300 on a small slate. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, 
I just think he's a really good, really good GPP play, especially if people are going to overlook him. Tags, what do you think? Oh, I like Terry McLaurin. I, I again the high ankle spring coming off of that, and he was a little bit lackluster right before that injury kind of took place so this is perfect for a tournament play he's not a guy that you want to play in cash obviously but uh for tournaments is a guy that could potentially see double digit targets at 6300 i like him how about you tags who's your guy uh you know there's there's quite a few guys that you could talk about i mean if i if you wanted to go really cheap i think zach pascal is interesting uh, is like a, a very, very, very cheap guy. Uh, but if you're looking in the more of that mid-tier range, I think Juju is a guy I'd look at. Uh, because again, uh, I like Deontay and Cash, but is there a possibility that Juju, you know, turns in, you know, eight targets, seven catches for 100 yards and a touchdown? Absolutely. Uh, especially without Kevin Johnson defending the slot. Because again, that they... In the games that he was out of the lineup, that's where they struggled most with slot wide receivers, and that's where Juju's lining up. So uh, at 5,500, you're getting a discount on him. And he's just been so up and down in his production that he's definitely not a cash play. Uh, right. So, you know, trusting him in a tournament lineup makes sense. Okay. Very good. Let's go to quarterback here. Who's a GPP play for you, Derek? It's it's Mitchell Trubisky again. Like, the quarterback is all going to depend on on the stack. Like, you're not just going to, like, one-off a quarterback. Yeah. Um, you're going you're gonna to play a quarterback with a stack that you like. Right. And so um, the, the Bears are a stack that I, I really like here, like for, for all the reasons I kind of mentioned earlier with, uh, I mean, I guess with Trubisky himself, I mentioned him before. Um, you know, like they're in the dome, they're going to be passing more, they're, you know, a pretty solid underdogs, so they're going to be passing more, they're going to be more efficient. And I just think the pricing on the Bears is, is way too cheap. I think that, um, you know, there's obvious options to pair him with. And so, you know, I think Trubisky's, you know, going to be, my favorite GPP quarterback, probably. Tags, what about you and GPPs? Yeah, I definitely, I, I like Roethlisberger and Trubisky for tournaments. Uh, obviously, you know, quarterback doesn't change so much in a slate like this because you're, base, in tournaments, you almost, as Derek said, you need to stack, obviously, but in tournaments, if you miss, quarterbacks have been so damn high scoring this year where it's like if you have a quarterback that scores 18 points, usually you're like, hey, that's pretty good. But if you have another quarterback in the slate like a Josh Allen that scores 37 points, all of a sudden you're looking at a big deficit that you need to overcome. Uh, so I, I'm going to have exposure to all these guys in tournaments, to be honest with you. Um, but Trubisky is definitely the one that I, I don't think I could play in cash, but I do like him in tournaments. All right, let's go to tight end then. Who's a tight end for you in GPP is Derek. Yeah, tight end's another position, especially on a really gross week like this, where you're not one-offing a tight end in GPPs. You know, I, th I think the best way to approach tight end is to make a tight end part of your correlation, whether it's your full stack, whether it's your secondary stack. And a guy that makes a lot of sense for me in that regard is Cole Komet at 3K. You know, I mentioned liking Trubisky and having obvious stacking partners. It's because, you know, you obviously have Allen Robinson as, as the guy who's going to command most of the volume. And you have Komet at a, at a really crappy tight end position who's underpriced and who is going to get a decent amount of volume. Since his snaps went up whenever it was, week 8 or 9 or 10 or whenever it was, he's been getting like 15% of the target since then. So for 3K in this spot, um, as part of your stack or as part of a secondary correlation, you know, let's say you want to stack the Bills. You want to stack Josh Allen. Um, you know, correlate Komet with Michael Thomas um, as, as your secondary stack. And so stuff like that is, uh, is the way I'd kind of approach tight end. Yeah, Komet was a guy who kind of stood out to me as well on both sides. I mean, he's 5,300 on, uh, on Fandle. I don't expect him to be uh, widely rostered or anything like that. And again, New Orleans is pretty good against tight ends, but you mentioned the target space since he's had a high snap share. Tags, is Mooney going to play in this game? Because I know he didn't practice yesterday. Do we expect him to play? Because if not, that, that makes Komet even a little bit more attractive to me. I expect him to play. Uh, I don't expect him to get close to the 13 targets he got last week. I right. think Allen Robinson's a guy that obviously he should, he should see double digit targets here. Uh, he's someone that we probably should have talked about more in the tournament spot. Uh, I think Allen Robinson is actually cash viable, but there's two other receivers, Michael Thomas and Deontay Johnson in that range that that's why he's probably not being talked about so much, but Allen Robinson is a good play, but yeah, Komet, I mean, the, the matchup against the Saints, they had been really, really good. Like Malcolm Jenkins seemed like he got caught up with the defense and, and ever since I think it was week two or week three, he, they'd been shut down. But over the last couple of weeks, they've actually looked human against uh, tight ends and Jimmy Graham, Cole Komet, they're used in different ways. Uh, that's why it's a tournament play though, because you don't know if those red zone targets are going to go to Graham or Komet, but uh, there's definitely a good shot that one of them does score in this game. So having exposure to one or the other. Yeah, I like it. All right. Defense, who do we got? Let's go to you, Derek. I mean, defense is always just defense. Like, it, it's whoever fits, honestly. Like, I really don't care that much about defense. There's so much variance in it. 
I think there's probably, I don't know, three three defenses you can probably just plug in and be fine in cash games. I think the Seahawks, the Bucks, and the Rams, I think they're all fine. But really, honestly, you can probably play any of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is certainly a week where it, it does kind of feel like, I don't know, whatever. Like, what whatever fits is exactly where uh, I think you should be looking. And tags, I mean, that, that's kind of how you roll, right? Whatever cheapest defense that you can swallow, you're willing to play. I do. I, 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 at 2,400, they kind of gave me a gift playing Washington. Uh, it's every every friggin' day, every week, dude. Everybody yep. disrespects Washington's defense. I don't get it. Uh, they're a team that's generated at least uh, three sacks in seven of the last ten games, uh, had at least four sacks in six of those. Tom Brady, here's the stat. Uh, Brady, when uh, throwing from a clean pocket, he has a 115 quarterback rating, which is the eighth highest mark in the league. When he's under pressure, he has a 54 quarterback rating, which ranks as the 28th best, right behind Daniel Jones and Sam Darnold. So if you're like, if you, like, I don't think it's a bad play. Even if Washington was 3K, I think they'd be a great tournament play. But in cash lineups, Washington at 2,400, it's the third cheapest defense in the slate. They just might be the best one. Uh, Brady hasn't been immune to turnovers this year. And again, once you generate pressure, all of a sudden you're talking about fumbles, you're talking about interceptions, you're talking about sacks. And again, this is. To me, I don't expect the Bucks to put up a whole lot of points on Washington, so you should get a low point total, too. I think you just get a decent floor with this defense. Yeah, and don't forget, it's a late game. It's after Brady's bedtime, so chances are he's, <laughs> he's going to be good for a sack or a turnover, at least, too. Yeah, I agree, Tags. We talk about Washington, like, every single week, basically, on this show, that they just haven't priced them accordingly, and, and they're always, you know, they're consistently getting pressure. They almost always make a good play at their price point. All right, let's finish it up here, guys. Let's start with the stack of the week. Go ahead, Derek. I mean, I've kind of been talking them up enough by now, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I like a Chicago stack, yeah. I think. I think people are going to, again, I, I haven't seen any ownership projections yet, so I really don't know yeah. what people are going to do, but just kind of guessing. I don't think people are really going to want to play the Bears on this slate. Like, it's a playoff slate. There's a bunch of good teams, and, you know, the Bears somehow somehow are a playoff team, but, but they're in a good spot. You know, they're 10-point underdogs. They're in a dome. They are all really cheap. Um, the stacks make sense. Like, Allen Robinson is the clear alpha there. You know, Cole Komet fills a really cheap, you know, tight end, a weak tight end slot. You can run it back with either Thomas or Kamara. Like, it just, the stacks make sense. The environment is good. Um, the prices are great. And presumably, possibly, maybe, the ownership's going to be low. So, so that's probably my favorite stack. How about you, Tag? Stack of the week. Mine's definitely on the Steelers' side of the ball. Um, you know, Roethlisberger, Deontay Johnson, Juju, and if you wanted to grab a piece on the other side of the ball, like a Jarvis Landry, I have no issue with that. All right. Lock of the week. Go ahead, finish this up. Go ahead, Derek. It's Michael Thomas. I mean, I, there's there's a legitimate chance he's 3K underpriced here. All right. Tags? I'm going to stick with Deontay Johnson. Both of us were in that same exact price range, and I, I understood the love for Thomas. I really do. I just think Deontay Johnson's the guy I'm going to ride or die with. All right. I love it. All right. This was excellent. We basically, the best thing about having a, you know, six games to go through is that you can touch on pretty much every player that yeah. we went through. So, Derek, I really appreciate you popping on. Remind everybody where they can find you and your work. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Derek Cardi. You can find my my projection system, The Blitz, over at Roto Grinders. Um, yeah, that's about it. Awesome. All right, well, we will be back next week doing another DFS podcast breaking down the divisional round. Until then, enjoy your football, and I will talk to you next week. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Make sure to check out our featured videos as well. Also, make sure to click that red subscribe button to get notified when we post videos in the future.